and thank you. Yeah, well, thanks very much for the invitation. And uh, feel free to interrupt, interject, query, criticize as we go through or at the end. I, I've got, it says 38 slides, but four of them are at the end in anticipation of potential questions. So uh, can you see that? I guess you can. Yes. I'm planning to do a very brief introduction uh, and then largely collapse psychopharmacology and landmark clinical trials into about 12 to 15 slides. The same for neuroimaging and genetics, and then a little bit of future gazing uh, towards the end if there's time. I'm planning to talk for absolute maximum of one hour, hopefully slightly less, slightly less. So there's plenty of time for conversations or an early bath if we if we prefer. So you know, I'm not a big fan of the term biological psychiatry. I have to say, I, I don't really know what it means. Certainly, if one was to uh, regard biological psychiatry as the study of biology relevant to psychiatry, that's basically the whole of life. Um, and Samuel Goos actually produced a very good paper on that with that exact title, or, you know, biological psychiatry, is there any other kind in psychological medicine in the early 1990s, which is worth a read, although he was generally advocating for uh, stressing the biological bits of psychiatry to medical students because that was the language they spoke and might actually be a recruitment aid. Um, there is, of course, a journal called Biological Psychiatry, which I've published quite a lot in over the years. I think if there is such a thing as biological psychiatry, it's some kind of discipline attempting to find biomedical or biological explanations for and treatments, uh, physical treatments for psychiatric disorders or mental disorders. It's also increasingly these days, it seems a term of abuse. Uh, nasty biological psychiatrists who have reductionistic approaches to mental illness and just concentrate on the brain. And I don't think there's, I don't know any uh, so-called or self-declared biological psychiatrists who have that kind of uh, narrower view of mental illness, but uh, maybe I do and I'm just not aware of it. So uh, I'm going to cover psychopharmacology and landmark clinical trials and uh, get cracking. And it's difficult to know where to start in the, in the, in the chapter. Uh, I was given the task of going for 60 years from 1950 to 2010. Uh, and that coincided with the rise of uh, this eminent pharmacologist called Sir John Gadam, who was a fellow of the Royal Societies of both Edinburgh and London, uh, and did a number of amazing things, including working with Senator Henry Dale, who discovered acetylcholine. Uh, uh, Gadam himself co-discovered substance P, uh, he was a prof of pharmacology in Cairo, UCL, at the University of London. He was then the prof of pharmacology in Edinburgh, uh, uh, spanning some 10 years or so before he moved to the Babraham Institute, now the Institute for Animal Research in Cambridge. Uh, and the reason for starting with him, apart from the fact that he uh, uh, was at least partially an Edinburgh-based pharmacologist, and, and more on that in a minute, he was doing experiments with LSD, trying to work out how it worked. Um, and he uh, thought that that was probably something to do with serotonin receptors, especially 5-HT2A um, agonism. And indeed, it seems that most of the hallucinogens uh, actually have 5-HT2 agonist effects. And 5-HT2 antagonism, as you know, was one of the models proposed for the atypical antipsychotic drugs, the so-called atypical antipsychotic drugs. Perhaps even more significantly, he was the first scientist to postulate that serotonin 5-hydroxytryptamine might have a role in mood regulation. And indeed, he didn't just think about that. He got young psychiatrist trainees like George Ashcroft and Donald Eccleston to do PhDs in his labs in Edinburgh and Cambridge studying serotonin metabolism um, in animals, but also in live patients. And they did a number of studies in the early 1960s uh, in Edinburgh at, at what had become by that time the MRC Council Unit for Research into Brain Metabolism. And uh, this paper from The Lancet was probably the pinnacle of their work, uh, which was published around 1966, I think, 
studied uh, several patients from Craig House in the Royal Edinburgh Hospital. And one of um, the PhD students in the lab, Dee Sharman, had worked out this way of being able to measure the concentration of, of a serotonin metabolite called 5-HIAA um, in the CSF. And so what they did was a pretty well controlled study of patients with depression, mania, schizophrenia, and neurological controls who were having a lumbar puncture for some other reason. And what they found basically was this uh, evidence of reduced serotonin metabolism in patients with depression. And in subsequent studies, uh, and partially this one, they showed that that was related to features of depression and actually remitted on treatment with antidepressants. There were a number of problems with that observation, least, not least it was nonspecific. Similar things were evident and have since become evident in schizophrenia. Um, and uh, the famous, or should I say infamous, monoamine theory of depression that they published in The Lancet in 1972, built on these kind of studies uh, and a whole lot of other evidence, but has certainly not survived the test of time in its original simple version that, you know, there is just a reduced turnover of monoamines like serotonin or adrenaline in depression. That is the, the biology of depression, if you like, is just not that simple. It's probably more to do with from a serotonin perspective, the stress response and modulating that, and it's obviously a lot more complicated than just serotonin. Ironically enough, the monoamine theory of schizophrenia, the dopamine theory of schizophrenia, uh, is alive and kicking, and we'll come back to that a bit later. And even though these um, psychopharmacological investigations didn't lead to a diagnostic test or new treatments in themselves, uh, what they did do through Donald Eccleston's work when he moved to Newcastle uh, and came up with a serotonin cocktail on the second line of that abstract there, phenylzine, L-tryptophan and lithium, which was shown in this randomized controlled trial and others to be effective in treatment resistant depression. So it's a good example, if you like, of how um, biological studies of etiology or pathophysiology, even though they know, may not be true or entirely true, can have therapeutic spin-offs. And this uh, serotonin or sometimes called Newcastle cocktail um, remains uh, a, a viable treatment strategy in treatment resistant depression. Now, around about the same time, obviously as, as Gadam and others were working on the psychopharmacology of these conditions, the uh, Medical Research Council put together a clinical psychiatry committee, which as you can see there on the bottom right of the screen, include very many very eminent non-biological, non-psychiatrists. So you have people like John Bowlby, um, Dennis Hill, Linford Reese, there's Ferguson Roger, um, and others of note on the committee, I think Bradford Hill, Archie Cochran, um, who were statisticians and epidemiologists, um, and what they did was a really an amazing study of more than 250 patients with depression. This was well before DSM-3 and ICD-10 when the categorization and classification of depression was a mess, but they defined their patients as essentially having depressed mood and a number of other features. And they were randomized to amipramine um, or uh, uh, an MAOI or ECT or placebo. Um, and the long and the short of it was that the antidepressants worked, especially amipramine, but not quite as well as ECT. Um, and some members of this group, uh, including Michael Shepard, went on to show that stay in, in, a, in a different population of exactly the same defined people with depression, staying on the antidepressants uh, reduced relapse to a su substantial extent. Um, and it's still a kind of uh, a pause for thought, I think, for me at least, that, you know, some 55 years later, we're still arguing in some places, at least in the Twitter sphere, as to whether antidepressants work, whether it's all bias and placebo effects. And yet this and other studies, to my mind, are pretty persuasive that the drugs do work. 
Um, this is a slide we can skip. I think we might have missed one or two, actually. Um, so uh, that study included ECT as one of its treatment arms. And there was a very active ECT research uh, momentum in the UK in the 70s and 80s. And as this slide shows from quite a recent systematic review done by the UK ECT Review Group, which include many eminent experts and also a number of uh, users or people with lived experience, ECT uh, worked um, beyond reasonable doubt. The intriguing thing about this from a, a British historical biological psychiatry perspective is that all six of the studies up until that point, 2003, which had compared re real ECT with simulated ECT, simulated ECT being the, the practice of giving the uh, patients in the trial an anesthetic and applying the electrodes, but not giving the current so that to reduce the chance of non-blinding researchers. All those trials uh, showed an effect and we pulled them together quite a large effect. And it's quite a stunning piece of evidence, albeit in only 256 patients from 40 years or more ago that uh, ECT works. And you know, this, as you probably do know, uh, remains uh, an active, again, to my mind, uh, unreasonably active debate in some quarters as to whether or not ECT works at all, whether it's inhumane, whether it should be banned. Um, and the evidence is pretty good. Uh, okay, these trials have not been recent, but I don't know if there's any other part of medicine where we would have to continually reprove findings again and again and again for each generation, rather than being able to move on and you know work out you know which patients ECT works best in, for example, would be the obvious next question, um, which some people have tried but have not. Um, we have not addressed as as rigorously or, or systematically as we we should have done. If we talk briefly about the landmark clinical trials in schizophrenia management, the, there were some controlled studies done in the UK, uh, especially in Birmingham. Um, but the, the landmark trial of antipsychotics for acute schizophrenia is undoubtedly the, the, MI, N, the NIMH trial, which was published in the Archives of General Psychiatry in 1965, showing uh, potent antipsychotic effects in people with acute and indeed some first episode cases uh, of schizophrenia. But it was the uh, British psychiatrists, namely Julian Leff and John Wing, who were the first to show that staying on the drugs, these antipsychotic drugs, kept people well. This was a relatively small trial of only 35 patients, but uh, it was well conducted and ended up in the BMJ in 1971. And of those 20, who were randomized to stay on antipsychotics, only seven relapsed 35%, whereas the 15 who were randomized to go on to placebo after responding, almost all of them relaxed. And that absolute difference of around about 45% is pretty much what has been shown time and time again. It's a massive effect. You get a similar size effect of staying on antidepressants in terms of reducing relapse. And uh, you may or may not be surprised to know, uh, you may probably already know, that these chaps were not biological psychiatrists in any way, shape or form. They were probably social psychiatrists. They certainly worked in the MRC social psychiatry unit. Julian Leff was famous for uh, looking at expressed emotion and trying to reduce that through family therapy and people's schizophrenia. John King famously came up with the present state examination, did some important work on rehabilitation of schizophrenia allegedly turned down a knighthood, according to someone who whispered something to me once upon a time, but I'm not sure if that's true. Um, but like many of these uh, trials uh, and other insights that I'm gonna talk about, um, this work was done by psychiatrists. Uh, this is a slide to remind me, uh, I've managed to allude to the NMH trial done in the States already. Obviously not all the great uh, work in biological psychiatry over the past 50 years has been done in the UK. And certainly the definitive trial of depot antipsychotics as being even better uh, than oral antipsychotics for reducing relapse uh, were 
was done uh, here by Gerard Hogarty in the States, a brilliant trial, which also simultaneously managed to look at the interaction of social therapy um, and found that basically social support was good and psychotherapy was bad for people with schizophrenia. Psychoanalytical psychotherapy. I'm going to, I'm going to skip this slide. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll skim over it briefly. So Stefan Lucht is uh, a German sounding and speaking uh, and living psychiatrist who now uh, does most of the Cochrane Library systematic reviews and meta-analyses of, of these kind of interventions. He tends to work a lot with John Geddes in Oxford uh, and they publish quite frequently in the Lancet of these overviews of the efficacy of antipsychotic drugs, antidepressants, mood stabilizers in both acute treatment and maintenance. And um, so this shows this at the top here, if my arrow is pointing in the right direction, can you see my arrow? Thumbs up. Uh, no, you can't see my arrow. So the very top line of that rather busy graph is about relapse over seven to 12 months later. Uh, they found 24 trials in more than uh, 2,000 patients in total. Uh, this average just study duration was 11 months. What this graph basically shows uh, is that the drugs are much, much better than placebo uh, at keeping people well or relapse free by this definition. And the number needed to treat is around about three. So you need to treat three people for one benefit, one person to benefit that would not otherwise have benefited. That corresponds roughly to that 30 to 40% reduction in relapse I mentioned earlier. And certainly if you show that's one of the most potent effects in all of medicine, if you, if you describe that to neurologists and cardiologists, they are well impressed. Uh, none of the drugs that they use have anything like these potency of effects. And yet still in psychiatry, uh, all too often, we seem rather apologetic about it or underuse it. I'm gonna to turn to imaging now. Um, and I'm gonna talk, Throughout, actually, going to talk mainly about depression and schizophrenia. Uh, I guess partly because they're most interesting to me, but partly because depression is the most common and schizophrenia arguably the most severe mental illness. Uh, when we come to imaging, I mean, if one was to talk about the neuroimaging advances in dementia, which I'm not going to, other than briefly allude to them, um, there would be a, I could give an even more positive account, and and certainly, you know. Uh, CT and MRI, structural MRI, are now routinely used in the assessment of people with dementia. There's a PET tracer that uh, people like Ian McKeith in Newcastle and latterly Cambridge have developed for reliably diagnosing Lewy body dementia, for example, and that has important therapeutic implications because they're particularly sensitive to anti uh, antipsychotics like risperidone. Uh, and now, indeed, the, although largely driven by American research, there are blood-based biomarkers for dementia and dementia risk. Um, so I could give an even more positive account of neuroimaging as a, as a measure of value in biological psychiatry, but I'm going to deal largely with schizophrenia and depression, uh, cover those five technologies there, computerized tomography, structural MRI, diffusion tensor imaging, functional MRI, and positron emission tomography. Very briefly, you may be relieved to hear. Anyone know who this guy on the right is? There's no... Uh, Hounsfield. Well done, Godfrey Hounsfield. He was a very interesting character. He went to work for EMI, uh, Electronic and Medical Instruments Limited, uh, straight from school, so he never went to university, and uh, ended up getting a Nobel Prize for co-realizing that one could... Um, computationally combine x-rays of the head into an image of the brain. Um, and actually, you can still see what I think is, is one of the original three CT scanners produced by EMI in the Science Museum in London. And um, as I think all of you will probably know, a young Glaswegian psychiatrist called Eve Johnston who had by fortune, by good fortune, uh, worked with one of the first CT scanners, one of those first three, because it was in Glasgow and she was doing her house jobs with it. Uh, I forget which hospital at. Um, she had, went to work with Tim Crow at the MRC Clinical Research Center at Northwick Park, just outside London. 
Tim said, I think a lot of these patients with schizophrenia seem a bit demented. Eve, why don't you go and scan them? Uh, and Julie, she did, which, uh, as she has told me, involved picking up patients, you know, at the crack of dawn all over London, driving them to Northwick Park for a CT scan. They then acquired images like these, uh, and she and others would blindly uh, trace the lateral ventricles, uh, as you can see quite prominently there, particularly in the top images. Um, and to increase the accuracy of these tracings on tracing paper, as the y-axis shows in this graph, it was an average of four measurements. So brain scan blind to the identity. And what they showed in this famous study published in The Lancet in 1976 was that people with schizophrenia as a group on average, and actually in almost every case in this analysis, had enlarged lateral ventricles as codified here as a, as a ventricular uh, to brain ratio. And that's one of the best replicated imaging findings in schizophrenia. It correlates as Sean Lewis and Robin Murray showed in a brilliant review article in the British Journal of Psychiatry in 1990. All, in almost every study, it correlates with cognitive impairment in schizophrenia. And that doesn't make, uh, that doesn't make any surprise to me. Uh, we can look at this kind of relationship between brain structure and function, particularly cognition, more sophisticatedly now with DTI. Um, but I think the reduced white matter that ventricular enlargement captures is fundamentally bad for your intellect and, so, and particularly for your reaction time. I think it's worth remembering that this, uh, you guys might remember better than I, I wasn't practicing in the 70s, but I was alive. And um, I think this finding uh, found almost unanimous hostile, a host, almost unanimous hostile, hostile reaction. So Ronnie Lang was still in his pomp, or well, maybe not quite in his pomp, but he was still very influential. I do love this quote <laughs> from his book 10 years earlier. We do not accept schizophrenia as being a biochemical neurophysiological, neurophysiological fact, and we regard it as a palpable error to regard it as such. Nor do we assume its existence nor do we adopt it as a hypothesis. We propose no model of it. I mean, I think that's okay as far as it goes. I don't, you know, I'm not sure that we know, uh, as may become evident over the next few minutes, that much about the pathophysiology of schizophrenia per se. Um, you know, schizophrenia is just a convenient working hypothesis. But we certainly do know uh, that people with the label of schizophrenia have various uh, abnormalities at a group level in brain structure and function. Uh, that are related to key experiences that they have. Um, and that comes largely from uh, structural magnetic resonance imaging. Now, again, rather like CT, there was some very fundamental work in developing this technology done in medical physics departments around the UK, particularly by uh, John Mallard in Aberdeen, uh, where I trained, and uh, by uh, Peter Mansfield in Nottingham. And again, Peter Mansfield ended up co-getting uh, a Nobel Prize for his role in the development of MRI. But we never had, and we certainly don't now, have uh, an MRI machine manufacturer based in the UK. Uh, it's another piece of, 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 uh, of UK uh, genius, if you like, that's been exploited by uh, companies based elsewhere, particularly in the USA. And I, have to, I think most of the fundamental, most of the early landmark studies of, of MRI and schizophrenia were done in the, in the, in the, in the USA. Uh, and it's been left to British psychiatrists like myself, Ian Wright, uh, Rachel Hania, and Paul Harrison to review these literatures. Uh, but it's very consistent that people with schizophrenia as a group have reductions of whole brain volume by about 3%, more reductions in parts of the prefrontal and temporal lobes. And that comes up with, there's now four or five different ways of approaching this from a technological perspective. Each technological approach shows basically the same results. Um, so it's, it's, got that, um, it's got that type of, of concurrent validity, if you like. Perhaps more important, Paul Harrison uh, and others have shown that you find the same when you look at post-mortem studies of people with schizophrenia, uh, when you look at the whole brain volume. And there's been a recent systematic review of the hippocampal post-mortem literature showing a similar greater reduction in that. Perhaps most intriguingly are, are the reviews done uh, here in the bottom paragraph uh, of studies which very consistently show that a reduced volume of your superior temporal gyrus uh, 
kind of close to Wernicke's speech reception or recognition area uh, is correlated with the severity of your positive symptoms and especially of hallucinations and particularly auditory verbal hallucinations. Um, and I think that's, I don't think that fact, uh, if I can call it that, is as widely appreciated as it, as it should be. Um, the, the neuroimaging community, perhaps inspired by the geneticists, have finally got their act together and are collaborating worldwide, which means um, these are obviously mainly North, North American and European studies um, that you can produce uh, study ends in the thousands. Um, and when you do that for the three major psychiatric disorders, at least as adult psychiatrists see, you find no absolute distinction between the conditions. It's important to acknowledge. You find a, a degree, uh, a greater degree of severity of whatever bit of the brain you look at, really. Importantly, um, what the enhancing imaging genetic meta-analysis collaboration has shown is that prefrontal cortical thinning is related to the severity of negative symptoms in schizophrenia. And again, cortical thinning in the superior temporal gyrus is related to the experience of hallucinations. So we have kind of uh, a, a, a kind of brain structure behavioral correlate there, uh, which I think is very important um, scientifically uh, and perhaps even philosophically. Uh, our contribution to this literature uh, and the British contribution more generally has been study people at high risk, whether as we study in the, in the Edinburgh High Risk Study because they've got high genetic risk because they come from multiply affected families, or whether people have, as people have studied largely in England, um, they are at high clinical risk because they have isolated psychotic symptoms come to clinical attention, uh, but have, do not have uh, schizophrenia. What we and others have shown is that those people at high genetic or clinical risk have milder degrees of the structural group differences uh, that are evident in people with schizophrenia. And indeed, that you can use fancy AI techniques like support vector machine analyses to, in this analysis that we did, predict who's going to get schizophrenia from a single structural MRI scan two and a half years before they got it, with an overall accuracy at the bottom here of 88% when we only looked at structural MRI data and 94% when we combined that with uh, a self-rating of schizotypal experiences and an objective memory test. Um, so that is a very active research area. And I think it's certainly a proof of principle that we can use structural and other studies using functional imaging to predict major mental illness. Um, the issue as to when that may or may not be ready for clinical use is perhaps one we might want to discuss later. So in an, in an analogous study um, that I don't think has been repeated thus far around the world, uh, Andrew McIntosh has led uh, a, a high risk study of those at high familial risk of mood disorders because of a strong family history of bipolar disorder. And what we showed in this analysis now eight years ago was that activation of the insula on a hailing sentence completion task, which is like a constrained verbal fluency task, uh, activation of the, of the insula, both sides uh, denoted those who were at particular high risk of going on to get depression in this analysis. And you can see in those far right figures, uh, the receiving operating characteristics of that insula overactivation are quite compelling. Um, they're probably not good enough to use as a diagnostic test. And this is just one paper, uh, but they're not a million miles away from the sort of ROC findings that one finds for some investigations that are widely used in medical practice, which are of course uh, not nearly as accurate or as simple as people like to think. I'm gonna to turn to positron emission tomography. Um, uh, and refer back to the dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia in, in three slides. This is done, this is uh, work done by Oliver Howes and his group at the Institute of Psychiatry in London. And what Ollie first did uh, was to systematically review all the PET studies. This is a PET scan on the left here of uh, fluorodopa concentration in the striatum um, on a fancy gamma camera called the positron emission 
tomography scanner. The figure on the top right shows you that if you inject people with fluorine labeled dopa, it's concentrated in the striatum in the brain and used to, uh, by neurons to manufacture dopamine, which is radioactive dopamine in the sense that it can be detected in a gamma camera. And so you can index dopamine turnover in the, lip, in the living synapse in people with schizophrenia and healthy controls, for example. And these are all the studies that Ollie Howard, when he systematically reviewed this literature, the vast majority of these were done in America. There's Ollie's own contribution from 2009. Uh, there's studies from the Karolinska, uh, but mainly North America. Anyway, what these studies as a whole show, in keeping with the dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia, a monoamine hypothesis of schizophrenia is like, is of greater dopamine synthesis and turnover in patients with schizophrenia. And it's not just uh, an artifact of medication. Uh, you get similar findings in unmedicated patients. Uh, and you can turbocharge that whole system uh, if you can get ethics to do it, as you only can in North America, by giving patients with schizophrenia amphetamine, which further increases their dopamine turnover. Uh, and that correlates with the increase in psychotic symptoms they get, uh, not surprisingly. So um, that's good. But Ollie then went on to in this, what he calls here at risk mental state group. Uh, these are people presenting to the Maudsley uh, at clinical high risk of schizophrenia because they have isolated psychotic symptoms short of schizophrenia. What this graph shows is that as a group, those at high clinical risk have elevated dopamine turnover in the striatum in this paper from archives in 2009. The graph on the top right shows that the extent of that dopamine turnover correlates quite strongly with the extent of prodromal psychotic symptoms uh, in those at high clinical risk. And in a further paper that Oli published in Molecular Psychiatry a couple of years later, um, those who have had uh, two scans those with the highest dopamine turnover were most likely to develop schizophrenia, and as were those who showed increases between scan one and scan two. Um, now, again, this, this, these findings, whilst compelling, have not been uh, widely replicated. I think there are, there's not that many people who are in the position to do this kind of technology. Um, where they have, they've generally find an elevated uh, dopamine turnover turnover in those at high risk of schizophrenia. And then an, an, another important study uh, done by our own Samia Johar, after a, a sojourn to Edinburgh, he ended up working with Ollie at the Institute of Psychiatry, did this very important study, I think, where they compared people with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia, crucially with psychotic symptoms. So, um, uh, and, and in particular, these were first episode bipolar and first episode schizophrenia patients without a long history of dopamine blockade exposure. So what this shows is basically a similarly increased dopamine turnover in those with bipolar disorder and psychotic symptoms as one sees in schizophrenia. So it's not so much a dopamine theory of schizophrenia as a dopamine theory of psychotic symptoms or psychosis, if you like. Uh, and the intriguing thing is what makes those two conditions different, if you believe, as I do, in those two conditions being fundamentally different. And indeed, the fact that one responds to lithium and the other doesn't would suggest that has some mileage as a concept. Um, the, I, I suspect it's neurodevelopmental disruption of one sort or another that underpins schizophrenia. And it's, it's circadian disruption uh, that underpins bipolar disorder and perhaps other mood disorders. As I've just spent three days talking about in a Wellcome Trust sponsored symposium. So I'm going to turn to genetics. Um, I seem to be getting through this uh, admirably quickly, hopefully and not too quickly. Um, I think arguably the contribution, the British contribution to psychiatric genetics has been even stronger than that to imaging or, or psychopharmacology perhaps not quite as strong as, as it has been to, as to landmark clinical trials. But um, so if one goes back uh, to the landmark paper by Gottesman and Shields, uh, where, where with the assistance of Elliot Slater at the Institute, uh, 
who had kept a 16 year record of twins that he had seen at the Institute, they were able to show, you know, beyond reasonable doubt that schizophrenia ran in families and begin uh, work that was continued by Peter McGovern and others, um, uh, and latterly Mike Owen at the Institute before Mike Owen and others moved to Cardiff, showing, you know, that schizophrenia and bipolar disorder have very high heritabilities of around about 70 to 80 percent, as indeed do autism and ADHD. Uh, and Mike Rutter, who recently died, uh, and may he rest in peace, um, produced this landmark paper, as you know, probably from nature, showing similarly that infantile autism had a very high genetic component as measured by heritability. If one fast forwards some uh, 30 years or so, the Wellcome Trust Trace Control Consortium, which was led by the psychiatric geneticists in Cardiff, Mike Owen and Mick Donovan and Nick Craddock, uh, amongst many other scientists and geneticists, it has to be said, um, they produced the first gene uh, of robust signal uh, that was actually associated with bipolar disorder, where they looked at seven common diseases, including Crohn's, rheumatoid, myocardial infarction, and a couple of others. Uh, and what they found was, a, you know, a small number of genes for each of these common diseases. Um, and these are these are single nucleotide polymorphisms. These are these are common genes that we all have, uh, but only in some of us uh, they seem to kind of increase the risk to get a diagnosable disorder beyond some threshold. I have to mention when I'm talking about psychiatric genetics, because I think it's, it's very underappreciated, perhaps because it's quite recent. If you look at the bottom line of this slide, the amazing deciphering developmental disorders study, which was done uh, at UK based NHS clinical genetics services, studied more than a thousand kids with various developmental disorders, including intellectual disability, very often as part of their syndromes. And what they found is if you do whole exome sequencing, around about 50% of kids with developmental disorders have an identifiable genetic basis, if you like, that might be going slightly too far. They certainly have identifiable genetic mutations that can be attributed, that one can attribute their developmental disorder to uh, that, that mutation. And it makes sense to me at least that um, you know, intellectual deficiency or learning disability is probably the most organic or biological bit of psychiatry. Um, and that genetic study would be in keeping with that kind of view. Uh, in contrast, uh, dare I say it, to how it's sometimes practiced. What um, these, as they have come to be known, uh, genome-wide association studies of large numbers of cases and controls have shown is that there are a very large number of common risk genes for each of the major psychiatric disorders, uh, some of which we all carry. Um, some of these genes may be associated with positive traits like creativity or open-mindedness. Um, but if you get too many, or perhaps in combination with adverse childhood experiences, life events, stress, taking the too much drugs in your adolescence and so on and so forth, uh, they can trip you into schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression. So this, this particular analysis, the, the Schizophrenia Working Group of the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium is led from Cardiff by Mick Donovan and now James Walters. Um, and they managed to amass no fewer than 100,000 people with schizophrenia and healthy controls. And when you do that, they found in this landmark paper in Nature 2014, no fewer than 108 loci on the human chromosome of the genome that were associated with schizophrenia. Now, not all of those have a known gene associated with them, but uh, because that itself is a, is a work in progress. But the genes that come up uh, as increasing the risk of schizophrenia include our old friend, the dopamine D2 receptor, or at least a gene near it, uh, lots of glutamate, and calcium signaling genes um, and lots of genes that are implicated or known to have an impact on neurodevelopment, for example. Now, one of the interesting spin-offs of this 
is because these genes are common and the technology is relatively cheap in contrast to neuroimaging, you can genotype every single person you could uh, and establish your own polygenic risk for schizophrenia. Um, and when you do that at a population level, where you basically, uh, you can account for around about 20% of the population liability to schizophrenia. At an individual level, that is nowhere near powerful enough to be a diagnostic test or a predictive test on its own. Um, it, it, um, if you're in the top 10% of those with a high polygenic risk score, you probably have a very highly elevated risk of schizophrenia, perhaps up to around about 40 or 50%, but it's still by no means you know, confirmative. Similar analyses have been done by the PGC in bipolar disorder. And so there's been a couple of recent papers um, looking at, published in Nature Genetics in 19 and 21, where just by virtue of increasing the numbers, you get here from 30 to uh, almost double that in terms of the number of genetic hits. And you get a slightly different profile. It's not that genes come and go. What you generally find is that as you increase the numbers in these analyses from uh, a few thousand to tens of thousands, uh, you find more and more signal. Um, and I could talk a lot about that slide, but I don't think I'm gonna get into any detail. It's interesting, for example, um, the CATNA A1C gene is also implicated in schizophrenia, but many of the other genes here, uh, like TRANK1 on the left are not. Uh, so some of the genes overlap, uh, and some of the genes do not. And I could show you a slide, I don't have one, uh, of work led by Andrew McIntosh in Edinburgh, uh, where they found more than 100 risk genes for major depressive disorder now as well. I think the interesting thing about these is, is not that they uh, lead probably to a diagnostic test, at least scientifically, what they do is allow you to do gene environment analyses uh, and look at the effects of environmental risk factors controlling for genetic effects, which should allow one to do much more precise studies, uh, perhaps ironically, of environmental risk factors and how they impact or increase the risk for people with different types of depression, say. So I'm gonna indulge myself in a wee bit of future gazing. Um, as I've probably alluded to, I don't personally believe in biology, biology, and nothing but biology. Um, I think biology has a role to play. Um, and uh, I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of, of where I think some advances may come in the next few years. So one of, one of the problems that we share with neurology um, in studying the brain, or in our case, the brain stroke mind, is access to the organ of interest, um, which is very difficult, if not uh, impossible, uh, in, in any direct sense, you know, you're never going to be able to biopsy the brain uh, in the way that you can biopsy just about any other organ of interest in medicine. But with the rise of stem cell biology uh, and the development of organoids, for example, in this work uh, done in Edinburgh by Mandy Johnson, you can begin to study the effects of risk genes. So here uh, we're talking about a copy number variation, which is an extra copy or a a lesser copy of a gene uh, here in um, a, con a condition called 16p1311 micro duplication. And what this showed, what Mandy showed was that uh, in very small numbers in this very high tech and expensive studies where it costs several thousand pounds a week to feed the cells. Um, uh, so in only three cases with this micro duplication, the organoids developed much more slowly as a result, uh, it would seem, of this microduplication. And you see this, uh, this kind of picture quite commonly. What this might allow us to do is study the effects of various drug treatments in terms of augmenting brain growth, although that is obviously risky. Um, so what Mandy did, for example, was uh, partially rescue this proliferation deficit by giving the cells an NF-kappa beta stimulant um, if you give NF-kappa beta stimulants to humans, they promptly develop epilepsy. Uh, 
Um, so it's not going to be as simple as, as, as all that. Uh, but at the very least, it's a scientific model. And as a, as a test bed for future drugs, it's going to be useful. It's very interesting to me, at least, that I think uh, three or four studies looking at hippocampal stem cells from patients with bipolar disorder have shown um, hyper excitability, as it's called, of hippocampal neurons, which at least in some studies can be rescued by lithium. Um, and so these, this kind of high-tech approach might be another way to uh, refine our search or study of how the drugs that we know work, how they work, because we still don't know that for antidepressants and lithium. Um, last couple of future gazing slides. So this slide's about the rise of data science. This is an analysis we did in a mere 2,864 brain scans from people in the UK Biobank sample. UK Biobank, as you may know, is correcting a massive amount of data in 500,000 UK inhabitants, largely over the age of 40, which is not ideal, but it's, it's still worthwhile. There will be ultimately uh, 50,000 or more brain scans uh, to look at. Uh, and so while one, whilst psychiatric patients are relatively undersampled and can't really be studied in large numbers in themselves, there's less than a thousand people in UK Biobank with schizophrenia, less than a thousand with bipolar, and only a few thousand with depression. Um, you can look at the impact of risk factors here, a polygenic risk score for schizophrenia across the population. And so what you see, what, what Emma Nielsen, one of my PhD students showed was that a high polygenic risk score for schizophrenia was associated at a population level um, with, a, with a, a very slight but detectable reduction in, in cortical thickness and brain volume. So these effects are there at a population level. They're much weaker than you see in patients. I think these effects are concentrated in patients for, for various reasons. And then one more piece, uh, uh, it's not so much future gazing as, as picking up uh, amazing pieces of research, recent research and, and seeing what they might be able to tell us. This was done at uh, Columbia in New York, uh, where Drysdale and colleagues studied depression, uh, used um, resting state connectivity to subgroup people with depression according to um, the level of movement and agitation they felt. And then they could, according to those subtypes that they could allocate them to, they were able to predict treatment response in a subgroup to here TMS. Um, obviously, if this was ever to become widely available or routinely used in clinical practice, you'd be interested in predicting treatment response to antidepressants or indeed CBT or non-response to either of them and get, get, get on with the lithium sooner rather than later or whatever approach, therapeutic approach you might favor or indeed the patient might favor. But it's another proof and principle of, I think, how the field can and indeed is advancing. And then I want to finish with one slide because sometimes the, the critics of, of biological psychiatry say, oh, you know, the whole thing's been a waste of bloody time and money and effort. Uh, 50 years, what have we got out of it? Not much. Um, I'm not sure we've done any more, much worse than the rest of medicine in terms of our search for underlying causes and, cert and certainly contrary, again, to some people's views in our development of new treatments. So this is just one slide on that kind of theme. This is a review of the drug development failure rate across medicine uh, done by Alteria and Guzzaro in Nature 2018. So if you look at the top figure, hematology does relatively well, but still only 25% of its experimental drugs ever get into clinical practice. And you look down the bottom, well, you know, here we are. We're not that much worse in psychiatry than neurology and perhaps surprisingly cardiovascular medicine. And perhaps even more surprisingly, we do slightly better at a hit rate than oncology, which you wouldn't think. Uh, given the advances in oncology, drug development, uh, earlier diagnosis, um, and arguably um, survival at five years, although some people think that's largely due to lead time bias, i.e. earlier detection, rather than prolonging life. Um, and if one looks for uh, Alzheimer's, 
where we pretty much know the neuropathology uh, and we've got, as I've alluded to, uh, good neuroimaging and indeed blood-based biomarkers, um, the proportion of drugs that come to market is awful. Um, and the new MAB that's caused all the stushy, which was approved, I think, last year by the FDA, and most clinicians don't think it actually works, and the evidence is rubbish, um, is perhaps, uh, at least in part, a reaction to that history. So uh, I wanted to make the point, and I could do it in other ways, that I think the kind of naysayers and doom merchants about psychiatry or biological psychiatry are, I think, uh, misplacing their negativity or should apply their negativity to the, to the whole of medicine, should I say. So uh, by way of conclusion, I'm very happy to discuss any aspect of this or, or indeed anything else you might wish. Um, I think there have been several notable British contributions to biological psychiatry, uh, some of which I've had the time to allude to. Others are in the book chapter. Still more got, ed got edited out, um, I'm afraid to say, and I've not had time to mention. I could mention, for example, the British con contributions to nosology from people like Bob Kendall uh, and Griffith Edwards um, in terms of defining recognizable syndromes. I'm, 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 I'm struck that these advances in what might be called biological psychiatry have been made by social psychiatrists, everyday psychiatrists, psychologists, neuroscientists, you name it, pharmacologists. Um, and it's something that I hadn't anticipated genuinely when I, before I began the literature review for writing the chapters was how often, I haven't really stressed it this evening, but it's maybe come out, how often these discoveries were made in med medical research council units, the brain metabolism unit in Edinburgh, uh, the clinical research center at Northwick Park, the social psychiatry unit at the Maudsley, the psychiatric genetics unit in Cardiff and others. Um, and these have often obviously gone in, uh, they've largely been under, unfunded by the MRC over the past 20 years. They made a strategic decision to move away from central funding of units uh, with their five year streams of funding, which allowed scientists to concentrate on the science rather than having to write grants all the time. Um, and to a more kind of response mode way of funding. Uh, I, I'm not sure that the pace of progress has slowed as a consequence, but I I think the MRC unit does at least testify to the importance of giving scientists some degree of free reign uh, and getting on with the science rather than, you know, housekeeping. Uh, as I've alluded to, I think the neuroimaging developments in the UK demonstrate the widely described, we develop it in the UK and then US business exploits it effect. Um, I think the pathophysiological studies like the dopamine studies of schizophrenia less persuasively the, the uh, serotonin and uh, monoamine and cortisol stories about depression. And although they've not been uh, conclusive um, and they've certainly not in themselves led to any new drug developments as yet, um, they do have explanatory value. And I think, you know, just like diagnoses, um, sometimes we need things to tell our patients. And whilst I would not want to mislead patients into thinking, oh, yeah, we know depression is, uh, uh, you know, a reduction in the availability of serotonin and noradrenaline in the brain. I think we can legitimately claim that those are involved uh, and um, studies such as those done by the geneticists and the brain imaging scientists show that there is some biological, in quotes, or organic, in quotes, basis to their problems. And I think very often patients want that. Um, sometimes they want a diagnosis as well. I think in terms of the future, in terms of using these technologies or others clinically, um, it remains possible. I'm, I'm not quite sure whether it's probable anymore because of, of the expense of these approaches, but it's, it's certainly possible uh, given a, no financial constraints that one could end up using genetic imaging and clinical features combined to predict things like early diagnosis, who might respond to particular treatments and outcome. That depends, however, on adequate funding for mental health research as a whole. Um, I don't think it's, there's any accident that uh, in the UK and the USA, most mental health research funding has gone to schizophrenia research, uh, 
and we know more about schizophrenia than in the other conditions. It's not a coincidence, you know. Research is costly, um, but you know, to my mind at least, uh, a worthwhile endeavour. So I shall stop there and gladly take any questions or comments. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Stephen. That, that was brilliant. A, a tour de force. Um, um, although this audience is small, you you will. I will certainly be recommending this recording to all and sundry, particularly my trainees of the future. Um, I, th I thought that was absolutely excellent. And I really enjoyed your chapter and, and learned a lot from it. Um, can I, I, I've got loads of questions, but we'll, let's, we'll, let's throw it out to the others. Um, so if, if you want to put your cameras back on and let us see you, you're there. And um, uh, Robert, Ken, Chris, yeah. <laughs> Uh, David's there, yeah. Um, David, do you have? Um, well, I was just wondering actually, uh, Stephen, if you took your slides down, then perhaps we could see one another, but. All right, oh, yes, of course, I'm in charge of that, sorry. Yeah. Um, stop. But a, a, quick, yeah. a quick question, just a, um, Can you see each other? Yeah, yeah. lovely. Um, the, just at the end there, you think that, that the, success rate of uh, anti-dementia drugs turns out to be something like 2%, which is way below even the other uh, specialties that you've you outlined there. So, yeah. so what's, what's that about? Do you, is there a reason for that, despite the effort? I think there's quite a lot of reasons for it. So um, I'm going to quote uh, Ian Reid, may he rest in peace, uh, who was in Edinburgh for a while and then Dundee and Aberdeen, uh, died prematurely. He said, you know, very memorably whilst we were having a fag outside at some conference. Um, you know, if you've, ever, if you've ever seen or held a dementia brain and you think about trying to treat that in terms of reversing the biology, forget it. You know, it's just too late. And I, I, I think, you know, by the time you're losing neurons uh, at an appreciable rate, I think it's probably too late. A lot of the drugs trials would be in keeping with that kind of view. You know, even the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors you know they're you have to prescribe them early to mm. have any benefit at all and i think there's a, i think the focus of a lot of clinicians is on early detection and in particular midlife risk factors for dementia and um i'm not sure that it is realistic to find a drug that can reverse neurodegeneration that has advanced to an appreciable extent. I mean, maybe that's, having said that, maybe that's too pessimistic, you know, so, right, um, you know, there are some amazing studies, so um, I'm struggling for the name, but I think that gene therapy, uh, there is um, Sarah Tabrizzi, who was in Edinburgh, is now at University College London, um, has done an amazing trial of gene therapy for Huntington's career. Uh, relatively early, but after the onset of clearly, you know, significant clinical features and did manage to find some improvements. So maybe it's going too far to say, you know, forget it, but I would be much more optimistic about um, early detection and earlier intervention to reduce risk or reduce rates of progression rather than actual treatments that would reverse the pathology. Right. I've always been struck, particularly with Alzheimer's pathology, that, that it's probably integral to the aging process. And, you know, and I, I pick up all these popular science magazines. I can't remember which one at the moment, one of the, the British ones, you know, um, more, you know, occasionally they'll run stories on a cure for aging, you know, and there'll be something about metformin, mm. you know, without diabetes might prolong your lifespan and so on. I, I mean, in terms of psychiatry, I've always been struck by the fact that people with Down syndrome get Alzheimer's pathology at that younger age. And yeah. if, if you do a sort of biological assessment of the aging process in people with Down syndrome, loss of skin elasticity, vascular changes, the, the, there is an acceleration of, of aging. So. So you, you kind of get into the, the, you know, the elixir of youth kind of <laughs> realm, I think, with, with that, particularly Alzheimer's dementia. And, uh, yeah. Absolutely. I think you're right. 
I'm struggling to remember his name, the double Nobel laureate who used to take mega doses of vitamin C. Oh, um, oh gosh. Linus Pauling. Linus Pauling, yeah. The chemist. Uh, he used to advocate mega doses of vitamin C. I think that's been busted. You know, m minor doses of aspirin, statins, you know, they don't, they don't seem to work very well and cause side effects in the process. So, yeah, I think, I think it's healthy living, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. It's the best way to age. Uh, nobody's lived forever yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, those those biblical ages of eight hundred years or something. Um, I think Kenneth wants um, to ask a question. Does he? Yeah, Ken, Ken, are you want to come in? And, oh, uh, you're going soon. But no, he's uh, just saying he's going. I was just to say how much uh, I enjoyed this evening's presentation. Uh, it's Thank lots you. of food for thought, but I haven't got any any comments at the present moment. So I really enjoyed. Okay, good. Thanks. Just the people in the new year. <laughs> thanks, Ken. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Take care. Take care. Thanks, Ken. Thanks. Cheers. So I, I'm going to ask a slightly naive question, and it, it probably is to do with my not full understanding of these Manhattan plots and GWAS studies and so on. But w within that, you know, I, 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 let me see if I get this right. Do the human genome, forty thousand genes, maybe twenty thousand are to do with the brain. So we're looking for these genes Probably. that might link to schizophrenia, bipolar. So how, how, how do you analyze for patterns, you know, like 10 genes that might be, in, might be off in one individual that, you know, is, is that all taken care of statistically in these analyses? Or, or could there be subsets where gene X, Y, and Z interact with each other and increase your risk and um you know i, I, I kind of you know kind of needle in a haystack type stuff um yeah well i mean that's, i think i think you're asking the questions that the the current generation of researchers are kind of asking um it is likely at least that it's combinations of genetic risk factors hitting perhaps particular pathways at particular times in development that underpin you know why you get depression in your teens or 40s why you get schizophrenia in your 20s and bipolar disorder in your 30s and you know classically um interacting with genetic with environmental risk factors obviously i think there are so you know we're doing an analyses for example trying to target target genes which are known to have immune functions to see if which is a subset of uh, a relatively small subset of those genes that have ident been identified as risk factors for schizophrenia or depression to see if they might constitute a subgroup of people at risk or identify a particular biological process um, i think that research effort is is very much ongoing but like everything in psychiatry it ain't going to be that simple unfortunately it looks like i think if there is a genetic or biological subgroup it seems most likely at the moment it's going to be an immune or metabolic disrupted subgroup of depression interestingly enough rather than schizophrenia i think schizophrenia the action is in neurodevelopment um so but the genetics is, you know, is, is, is there's a lot of elements to it. So these copy number variations that I mentioned, where uh, people have an, basically an extra copy of a gene or uh, lack a copy of a gene, they probably account for maybe two or three percent of cases with schizophrenia. Um, Fifteen percent of people with of cases with learning disability and comorbid schizophrenia. So they're very commonly associated with neurodevelopmental and, and indeed congenital physical abnormalities. Um, they are a recognizable subgroup. Um, they are almost certainly underdetected in everyday clinical practice. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, the, the other kind of counterintuitive thing in all this is, you know, common genes maybe for different phenotypes of mental disorder, common neuroimaging findings. Um, 
Yeah, but I, th I mean, that's maybe found in other medical conditions or same genetic genes leading to different patho uh, pathological entities and so on. Um, as, as I'm telling this, I'm, I'm thinking back because I, I used to be very interested in psychiatric genetics to some World Congress of Psych Psychiatric Genetics in London. You, you may have been there. Stephen, where an American was showing some pedigrees and saying, you know, this, the DRT2 gene or whatever gene, you know, running in this family. And, you know, here's somebody who's schizophrenia, someone had bipolar. This person uh, worked in a circus and swallowed swords or something. And, and he was explaining. <laughs> and Tony, Tony Pelosi was in the audience. And, um, and, and the American didn't realize that Tony was taking the piss. It, it yeah. Was, and Tony was saying, if this is true, you are the Isaac Newton of psychiatry. <laughs> and um, but um, but that that notion of and, and, and maybe that underpins to NIMH say, leave diagnoses aside when you're looking at fundamental mechanisms in psychiatric uh, biology, etiology. Um, and and just you know study a biological factor in multiple conditions and uh, and 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 don't be too pinned down by di diagnostic rigor is 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 that something that that you know if you, your own research would do now that you would well there's a there's a lot in that question Ian the um so a couple of responses to it I think the so the genes for schizophrenia massively overlap with those for bipolar disorder and indeed for depression, interestingly enough. Uh, they also overlap massively with the gene genetic risk factors for multiple sclerosis. Okay. Um, but in general, um, the problem we have in psychiatry is that our genetic risk factors and our environmental risk factors overlap to such a large extent that our diagnosable disorders in terms of their genetic or environmental or biological basis are much more similar than in neurology or indeed the rest of medicine. So the disease processes, assuming there are some, which I think there probably are, uh, or at least, you know, biological pathway disruptions that underpin the symptoms that manifest as the syndromes we diagnose, um, I think they are detectable and could be dissociable. Um, The, uh, and part of it is just plugging away, doing large enough, well enough funded research studies mm -hmm. that can actually be definitive rather than yeah. too many we small yeah. we, me too type studies, which are, yeah. you know, uh, bedevil the field of psychiatry, just as in most other parts of medicine, to be honest. I mean, cardiology and neurology stand out as different because they've got their act together to do massive trials and massive studies mm -hmm. better than the rest of medicine. But, Psychiatry is, is, is better off than many other aspects of medicine yeah. um, in that regard. The, um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think that's I probably, I think I've lost part of the second thing I was going to say in terms of what you were saying towards the end. You're doing but, research with not, you know, broadening the, the net, not, not yeah, being. I think, so this has been, a, yeah, this is, I mean, this is, I, you know, Clinicians need diagnoses, I think, um, you know, and Bob Kendall was very good on this kind of stuff. You know, clinicians are never going to try and have measure 10 dimensions in their patients uh, and then allocate treatments based on that. You know, all the treatments have been done on diagnoses, as we've you know, discussed this evening. So, you know, you can't just wave a magic wand and do away with diagnoses and pretend that's going to solve psychiatric research problems and all the rest of it. I'm open to the possibility of researching things like RDOCs um as add-ons that may provide additional value in terms of predicting treatment response or outcome um and if you know if in time they become better than diagnoses great yeah um but i, I doubt they will to be honest i think what they might i think i think the most likely event is that we, um and the welcome and the research funders are very very much aware of this and quite keen on it is funding research on dimensional experiences, common problems like sleep, for example, came up a lot in the past two or three days 
workshop I was at. Right. Um, as well as the as well as the diagnosable disorder stuff. Um, and you just see what works best, you know, horses for courses in a, in a kind of pragmatic medical kind of way, you know. Yeah. You, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, Chris, you've got a question. Hi, uh, Prof Laurie, thank you very much. That was, that was really um, insightful and interesting. Um, I hope yeah. I could maybe just play devil's advocate a little bit. Um, Go for it. That said, it, it, at the same time, it is actually my view. <laughs> so, okay. um, so I, I my my concern, that the, the um, my concern with regards to biological psychiatry, which is obviously, as you've already alluded to, not a particularly helpful phrase. Um, but my concern is that there's a kind of for, for some people who would advocate for biological psychiatry, there's an underlying assumption that. The reductive scientific method that has served us so well across much of science historically that kind of process of reducing things down to their more basic parts as a means of explanation is going to be successful in psychiatry and so i don't know if that's a view that's that you share and, and if that's a view that is kind of necessarily pervasive across biological psychiatry in general but my concern is if if the mind is and, and it's a big if, but if we think of the mind as a as a dynamical system that has emergent properties, and um, there's there's good reason to think that that, you, that we might not find dysfunction at the level of the brain. So even though the mind emerges from the brain, the the levels of dysfunction might be at at, at a different level, so to speak. Um, so I suppose it was just to, to hear your thoughts on, on, on that. And I suppose uh, grounding all of that is the kind of philosophical questions of the relationship to the mind and brain and, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's an interesting question. Um, I could respond in quite a lot of different ways. Uh, so uh, I read quite a lot of philosophy in the 1990s about the kind of mind brain problem and kind of concluded, well, we hadn't really discovered much, but at least philosophers had a very clear way of thinking about the problem. Uh, uh, and, you know, that kind of rigorous philosophical approach to science generally, let's say, has a lot to be said to it in terms of ensuring that one is thinking clearly about things. Um, and then I started reading about... Uh, I don't know if you've come across this uh, Bayesian or predictive processing approaches to the mind brain interface. And I find them compelling um, in a way that is uh, quite exciting, actually. And there is a lot of what people call computational psychiatry work ongoing. I wouldn't say that the field in general has arrived at any degree of consensus uh, in terms of kind of consistently replicated findings. But it seems quite persuasive and there's enough research to support the view that, um, you know, the, it's not so much that the mind and brain are dissociable, they're kind of the two sides of the same coin almost. Uh, one is the function, one is the structure, if you like. And that one can detect uh, brain behavior links at that, uh, at every level. So I gave the example of you know, structural brain to auditory verbal hallucinations. There's a few missing links in between there, obviously, but approaches like computational psychiatry, uh, Bayesian approaches to the mind brain, predictive processing can bridge those gaps. So uh, I'm not sure what I would say we need. Um, so I, I would, I am inclined to disagree with the view that, you know, reductionism is, is, bad, useless, hopeless. I think, you know, as I've tried to demonstrate again, you know, in some ways, some of these kind of reductionist approaches I've talked about have yielded, you know, there is some biological validity to schizophrenia in terms of its genetic basis, for example, you know, uh, I don't really care whether we call it schizophrenia or psychosis, and hopefully we'll subtype it in the future in some useful therapeutic ways. Um, 
So I don't, I don't think the whole, I would disagree with the view that the whole project is flawed or hopeless, but I'm certainly open to the possibility that there are better ways of, of thinking about the problems uh, and better ways of, of uh, analyzing them. I think all these concepts like schizophrenia, bipolar, they're kind of working hypotheses, aren't they? They're working models, which have stood the test of some time. Um, but you hope, as in the rest of medicine, really, that you hope to do away with them. So, you know, uh, I had hoped when I was your age that we might have got away from the group of schizophrenias by now, um, but we haven't. Um, you have to wait until something better comes along. And I don't, you know, so it's not that I think that the, I guess I've got an integrative way of approaching these problems. I don't think the mind brain interface is, you know, insoluble. I do think that, you know, what you might call reductionistic technologies have a role to play. I don't see how those can't be combined with people's subjective experiences. I think we could do all those things better. Um, and it's good to question them, but I don't want to, you know, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah, no, that good answer. I, I thought the last point in your last slide was, you know, it, 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 it's not recognizable as kind of pure reductionism of old, you know, in a way, the, the brain is such a complex organ, mind brain, and you're, you're, you're looking to look at it in a more complex way of, um, you know, with your machine learning Bayesian theory. Um, a wee bit in your chapter, I, I, I need to ask you this question. Is, is there, when you do your high risk study for schizophrenia, am I right in reading that you are seeing as someone progresses towards schizophrenia, differential changes in the brain? So in a way, the sort of smoking gun of, you know, this person's progressing schizophrenia, this bit of the brain is either shrinking or not developing as quickly, um, which, which I think is quite an astounding argument for, for the biological element in schizophrenia. Is, it, is, is that what, I, what I, am I understanding? Like yeah, I, chose to, I kind of chose to skip over that tonight. Um, yeah. A bit involved to get into it, but I'm happy to get into it now uh, as briefly as I can. I think the, Yes, is the short answer. That there yeah. are uh, definitely dynamic changes in the studies that have been done. There's not that many, and they're relatively small. Um, and you know, people might disagree as to exactly where this process is going on. But they, yeah. it seems to be concentrated in the frontal lobes and temporal lobes, perhaps sub bits of them. And, and it's not loss of brain cells. The postmortem studies have convincingly shown that it's probably a loss of neuropil, a loss of connections um that is what one seems to be able to detect in structural mri scans and it's um it, we showed in one study quite surprisingly concerningly alarming uh rates of reduction in in brain size of various bits that were that were correlated with the increasing severity of of delusions and hallucinations particularly in the prefrontal lobes um, sorry, sorry, yeah. So I, I think the, I think those are probably not irreversible changes, unlike Alzheimer's diseases yeah. we were talking. I think, um, you know, quite what I'm not sure that's the biology of. It's probably not the biology of schizophrenia. It may be the biology of stress, mm. um, uh, and it may what those what we may be marking there is is a uh, an impact of stress on parts of the brain that tip into psychosis for people with other vulnerabilities. Yeah, yeah. Because in this, I mean, we're up, I'll, I'll let you away shortly, but in this series of seminars, I, um, you, you may or may not know, I had my mother had schizophrenia from when I was three years yeah, I old. I remember you saying that, yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, when I was confronted by a Richard Bento or a Lucy Johnston and they, um, and they get into the issue of understandability of psychosis, I, it tends to press buttons where I'm saying, "Hold on a minute, you know, my, you know, my mum was fine, and then she had my brother, and then she got ill, and she never got better, and there was a discontinuity." So the, this Lenin notion, romantic notion of somehow it causes is understandable. You know, I, I, I really struggle to to deal with that, and I think I think a finding like you've just described helps explain the biological nature of, of schizophrenia, which I, I really do believe in from personal experience. But um, 
Anyway, that's that's my little thing. Well, um, I, well I, yeah, I could, I, I've got more time for Richard than Lucy because he's more of an empiricist. But I think I yeah. think sometimes psychosis is explicable, but sometimes it isn't. You know, yeah. just like sometimes people have a relapse of depression and it seems yeah. to be related to stress or life events. And sometimes it just happens out of the blue for no good reason. And, yeah. you know, um, we have to be open to both possibilities. Obviously, I think if you see relatively mild cases uh, in uh, psychotherapy trials, for example, uh, rather than inpatient IPCU wards, uh, I yeah. think the, the psychosis is likely to be more explainable or understandable. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and uh, another take on home message is the drugs do work. I, I have a picture on my wall in my office of a lady who was in Gartnavel in 1890. The picture was put in her case note. Um, she undoubtedly, from reading her case note, had agitated depression. She went into the hospital for three years. Her husband took her home unchanged after three years. And antidepressants work, ECT works, um, we have made progress is, my, is what that picture is saying to me. And, and your talk tonight very much underlined the fact that psychiatric drugs do make a difference. So I, I'm very grateful for that. Um, I, I think the biological strand of psychiatry, we just need to keep going. You know, it may, it may not be in our lifetime, but maybe one day we, we will get that more definitive etiological understanding of severe psychosis. I, I can't thank you enough. I, I, I was a small audience, but th this was wonderful. And we, we, will, we will get you a larger audience virtually, I promise. Yes, <laughs> yes. thank you very, yeah, very much. Uh, really fascinating. Uh, uh, yeah, really good. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, as, as a chair, I think we, we've had great standards to these talks and this was another great talk. So uh, yeah. th thanks for giving up part of your evening, Stephen. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hopefully, uh, hopefully.